you have your copy of God's Word, let me invite you back to the book of Jeremiah. Back to the book of Jeremiah. I want you to find Jeremiah chapter 26. I know some of you thought maybe he'll forget that he's in Jeremiah. We'll get some New Testament. We're going to get some New Testament today, I promise you, but no, I could never forget this book and the significant impact it's made on my life and your life. And for those of you who are guests of ours, before I had my opportunity to take some time off, we were preaching through the book of Jeremiah. In fact, one year ago next week, we began this journey. And I want to begin a new series with you today called Beautiful Burden. Before I do, though, let me just remind you where we've been. A year ago, last August, I started the book of Jeremiah in a series called Called Out. I hope you remember that. And then we moved to the very next series, Losing My Religion. We followed that series up with a series about God's word to the broken, blessed to broken. And then as we worked through the chapters of Jeremiah, we saw how the potter's house showed us God reworking. And then, of course, after we reworked our lives, we talked about lost leaders and Jeremiah's prophetic word to the people around him. Just to remind you who Jeremiah is and what he's doing. He is an Old Testament prophet. If you need to use your table of contents on your Bible app or in your copy of God's Word, there's no shame in that. You'll find the book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament. And we chose to go into the Old Testament and to preach through the book of Jeremiah without knowing all that 2020 and 2021 would contain. But God in his providence certainly prepared us because it was a prophetic word for our year. This is the way God works. Often people get enamored with prophecy and biblical prophecy. And the truth is, is that the prophets most of the time spoke to their context and their culture with prophetic authority that still speaks today. In fact, most of the biblical prophecy in the Bible, of course, is descriptive, not prescriptive. What I mean by that is, is that it describes where people are and what God would have them do more than it predicts the future. Now, there is predictive property prophecy in the Old Testament. We know that many of the prophecies of the book of Revelation have not yet taken place, and some of those same prophecies are recounted in books in the Old Testament, like the book of Daniel. But often, prophets were nothing more than preachers in their day looking into their culture, stepping up to the microphone of their platform, and speaking a word from God. And that's why I count it such an honor to open this book with you to this new sermon series, a sermon series that really signals a change in the book of Jeremiah. We've gotten all the way up to chapter 24. Chapter 25 is really a summary of the first 24 chapters, and it is in chapter 25 that we have the biblical prophecy <coughs> that the exile will take place for 70 years. Now, what exile and what 70-year period? Well, let me explain. God's people had been warned that if they strayed from worshiping the Lord alone, that God would discipline them. What loving father wouldn't discipline and punish his people? And he clearly forbid idolatry. And so, excuse me, like many of you, I'm dealing with some sinus issues. And because of that, <coughs> what happened was God raised up not one but many prophets to say to the people of Israel, Turn back to me. Jeremiah's call was to tell the people of God, there's still time for you to individually repent, but God has decided that judgment's coming, and Israel, the nation, God's people, is going to fall. In fact, Jeremiah has the difficult task, the beautiful burden of telling Israel that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed by the Babylonians under a king named Nebuchadnezzar. Now, this happens throughout the entire prophecy. The book of Jeremiah is not chronological in its order. It is a collection of prophecies that goes back and forth through various times over a 40-year period that Jeremiah prophesied. In fact, we're going to see that today because Jeremiah chapter 26 signals a change. 
we find that most of the language here and to the end of the book is in the third person. It's about Jeremiah, <coughs> and it's not written from Jeremiah's perspective in the first person because things are beginning to happen to Jeremiah due to his faithfulness. Now, here's what I mean. Jeremiah is beginning to feel the brunt of having to obey God even when it is a burden. Burdens are never enjoyable. They're never enjoyable, but they can be beautiful. One of the greatest things you can ever do for a Christian is to let them know that God has the right and the plan to bless you with immense joy, but he also will and can allow you to go through difficult things for his glory. The reason this matters is it gives your suffering purpose. Our initial human reaction to any kind of suffering, discomfort, persecution, is to get away from it. I mean, this is what I normally want to do. When I go through something difficult, I want God to take it away. Lord, heal me. Lord, remove this situation. Lord, provide for my need. Lord, help my brother. Help my sister. And there's nothing wrong with asking the Lord for a special blessing. But often when we walk through those times, we begin to recognize that it is in the suffering, in the trial, in the difficulty, that we strip away the superficial things we've been depending on, and all of a sudden, our walk with God and our intimacy with Him takes on a whole level of importance and significance. And then on the other side of the burden, what we recognized was it was a difficult journey, a journey we don't want to repeat, but it was one that was beautiful because God used it to draw us closer to Him. Thus, a beautiful burden. You ever watch the old court TV shows? Anybody remember Judge Wapner? <coughs> Come on now, right? One of the things you see in every court is usually representatives, attorneys. You see the person who's accused. You may see witnesses. You will see a judge, and in some situations, you'll see a jury. We've all seen this played out, Law and Order and other famous movies about trials. We know they're very uh, intriguing to us. But often in the corner, you miss the court reporter. The court reporter is someone who is trained to use a special machine that allows him or her to type in the moment instantly every word that is said into what becomes the trial transcript. It is a very important document. In fact, it takes two to four years of training to become a court reporter, and you have to be able to type faster than 225 words per minute. Some of you didn't type 225 words your freshman year of college. <laughs> 225 words <coughs> per minute. Now, in thinking about that, I thought about chapter 26. Chapter 26 of the book of Jeremiah is the court report of chapter 7. Now, chapter 7 was months ago. I don't expect you to remember, but something happened in chapter 7. In chapter 7, God told Jeremiah, go to the temple and preach against what is happening. So, it's not that Jeremiah's on the outpost. He's not on the outskirts of town. He's at the temple. He's right in the gate where people are coming to worship for all the wrong reasons. He's going to the church and calling out hypocrisy. He's going to Israel and saying, you're going through the motions, you're offering the sacrifices, you're muttering the prayers, you're listening to the rabbis teach, but there is no change in your heart. This happens in chapter 7, and what we find in chapter 7 is that he gets himself in hot water. In chapter 26, we're given the notes of the trial. Look with me what God says in Jeremiah chapter 26, beginning in verse 1. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came from the Lord. Thus says the Lord, stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak to all the cities of Judah that came to worship in the house of the Lord. And all the words that I command you and speak to them, do not hold back a word. I must admit, church, when I read that, I thought about how much I love standing every week and knowing there's no pressure on me to ever hold back a word. Give God's people all of God's word. So Jeremiah is told, go preach. We know this is in chapter 7 as well. Look what happens in verse 7. 
or excuse me, in verse 4. You shall say to them, thus says the Lord, if you will not listen to me to walk in my law that I have set before you and to listen to the words of my servants and the prophets whom I send to you urgently, though you have not listened, then I will make you this house like Shiloh, and I will make this city a curse for all the nations. Why does he want them to listen? Well, look at verse 3. Go up again. It may be they will listen and everyone turn from his evil way, that I may relent of the disaster that I intend to do to them because of their evil deeds. Throughout this book, we've seen some pretty harsh words from God on judgment. But notice the grace here. Even now, even now, Jeremiah is being told by God, go and preach again that they may turn. And if they turn, I will relent. I'll change course. <clears throat> Within my sovereign will, I will choose to give grace instead of punishment. I want you to know this morning that no matter how far you may feel from God, the moment you confess and repent of sin and move away from it, that very moment God binds himself to begin the process of healing and forgiveness and renewal. There is no biblical precedence or teaching for penance. Penance is not a biblical doctrine. Penance is not something that we should ever build our life on. For many people, they think, well, I have to go through a certain amount of suffering to pay back for all the evil that I have done. The problem with that type of thinking is, number one, you're limiting the grace of God. You're saying that your sin outweighs the sacrifice of Jesus. See, the blood of Jesus is available to forgive us of our sins instantly, eternally, and completely. So that when we turn from our sin and repent, granted, we may be dealing with the consequences of our struggles. We may have to deal with the fallout from relationships that we've hurt but we no longer have to live under the condemnation of God. And we see this even in Jeremiah. He is saying, go to him one more time. But then he says, if you don't, I'll turn this place into utter destruction. Now look what happens in verse 7. The priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. And when Jeremiah had finished speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people, then the priests and the prophets and all the people came to the altar, gave a big offering, prayed for Jeremiah, and thanked him for the sermon. Is that what verse 8 says? I was just seeing if you were following along. No, that's not what it said. This is what it says. And all the prophets laid hold of him, saying, You shall die. Now, I've preached some pretty bad sermons in my life. I know at times I've gone a little bit over time. I, I recognize that. I've never had anybody come to me and say, you need to die for preaching that sermon. And yet Jeremiah here lays his heart on the line, and they say, you should die. Why would they say that? Look at verse 9. Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, this house shall be like Shiloh? And this city shall be desolate without the inhabitant. And all the people gathered around Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. If you want to take notes, three lessons from Jeremiah's trial. Number one, obeying can be offensive. Obeying God means that you're going to offend people sometimes. We live in a culture that is running from offense. And it has almost now become so offensive to think about offending someone, we spend all our time worrying about who may or may not be offended. Now, I want you to know if you're naturally a confrontational, angry, or an abrasive person. Some of you may have a personality like that where you naturally struggle with a temper. You naturally struggle with patience. The Bible that I hold speaks to you and me as someone who has struggled at times with patience and says we are to be kind. We are to be gracious. We're to be considerate. We're to be slow to anger. We're to be soft in our language. We are not to go and look for abrasive confrontation with individuals. As much as it depends on us, we should be people, men and women of peace. 
But the same scripture says that we don't move off the truth and the truth will offend people. I thought about that just a few weeks ago where two people, two leaders from other denominations, uh, people who are followers of Jesus who would have some fundamental differences in their doctrine than me had to take some pretty difficult stands. I think about the Archbishop of San Francisco who came out and said that any person who promotes abortion rights should not receive Holy Communion. And this guy got taken to task because he was over the church where the Speaker of the House, who is a huge advocate for abortion rights, says that she practices her Catholic faith. And we see this clash happening because you can't read the Bible and ever defend the killing of children in the womb. It's just not able to be done without misinterpreting or downgrading the truth of God's Word. Even more recently, last spring, uh, Jody Ray is the pastor of the largest Methodist church just north of Atlanta inside of the state of Georgia. Man that loves God. The bishop over him removed him from his ministry because he believes God's Word about human sexuality. We know that this is ripping apart the United Methodist Church. That denomination is dealing with what do we do with the subject of homosexuality. And he stood in his pulpit and preached a sermon about the fact that he would not move off God's Word. In fact, these are his words. I'll quote them directly from the sermon he preached last April. To my family, this is the day he knew he was going to be stripped of his job. Remember this day. We are a family who lives by our faith and our values. God is Lord of our life. Jesus Christ is Lord of our life. And it's him and him alone who determines our future. We don't back up or back down, he said. He went on to say, and I also want you to remember this, to his children from the pulpit, that your daddy didn't bow the knee or kiss the ring of progressive theology that is, in fact, not theology at all. Ray told his children, be careful of secular ideologies and thoughts that often come described as biblical truth. He goes on to say, know and understand the Scripture in such a way that you can determine through the Holy Spirit what is right. The pastor warned his congregation, and now his congregation is more than likely leaving the United Methodist Church denomination over this issue in support of their pastor not moving off of it. Now, you don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be an archbishop. You don't have to be an evangelist or a missionary. You don't have to be a small group leader. Everyday Christians are finding more and more that if we don't move off God's Word, people will find our views offensive. They should find our life loving, our language kind, But our God does not change. His word is true, and we don't omit one single truth within it. So Jeremiah is dealing with the fact that obeying can be offensive. You have permission to recognize that if you love Jesus and believe his word, your world will find you offensive at some point. That's okay. It's not New. Jeremiah's preaching to the so called people of God, and they don't want to just not invite him back. They want to kill him for what he said. Secondly, Jeremiah's trial teaches us defending your life can mean denying it. Look what happens. I love this, man. You want to talk about a word for today? Look at verse 10. When the officials of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house. This is when a trial really starts happening. In fact, If you love biblical history, this is the most detailed recording of an Old Testament trial in the Bible. We have a very, very detailed recording of a New Testament trial, the trial of Jesus. And we have several times where Paul is put on trial in the book of Acts. But in the Old Testament, this is the best example of how trials would happen. The word got around and the officials came and a public gathering was called. And this is where Jeremiah is officially put on trial. And these are the trial notes. When the officials of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house to the house of the Lord and took their seat in the entry of the new gate of the house of the Lord. Then the priests and the prophets said to the officials and all the people, verse 11, this man deserves the sentence of death. Again, this is not a mob. 
They're not trying to uh, take him out and hang him. They want him tried and executed officially. This man deserves the sentence of death because he has prophesied against the city, and you have heard it with your own eyes. For them to attack Israel is to attack their religion. Their religion, of course, was corrupt because they had put their faith in who they were and not in what their God had said. Look at verse 12. Then Jeremiah spoke to all the officials and all the people. Now watch this. The Lord sent me. Notice that Jeremiah takes the opportunity not to defend himself, but to just re-preach the sermon. I got more people here to listen. I'm going to tell you again what God told me to say. The Lord sent me to prophesy against the house and this city and all the words you have heard. Now, therefore, mend your ways. Jeremiah's not angry. He's not wrathful. How dare you put me on trial? How dare you question me? How dare you attack my freedom? No, no, no. Jeremiah says, hey, here's another opportunity for me to say, God wants you and your heart to turn back to him. Even in his defense, he's denying his own personal rights. Church family, listen to me now. Lean in real close. Our country is having a discussion about freedom. It's all around. Everybody has different views about it. I have certainly strong feelings about freedom. It's one of the reasons why I believe God honored our church during, and we're still enduring, a pandemic. We felt like the best decision was to let every family make the decisions that's best for you. I'm going to be here and preach. And if you want to join us online or you want to join us in person, if you feel more comfortable wearing a mask or you do not, If you want to choose to wait until you or your family members are fully vaccinated, we gave you the freedom to do what you feel is best from a deep conviction that you are the best person to make the decision for your family. But I'm going to stand here and I'm going to preach. Our country is having this discussion. But one of the things Christians have to remember is in the midst of our nation changing, some think for the worse. In the midst of our nation changing, our first and foremost conviction would be to communicate the gospel and not defend ourselves. Listen to me. There's nothing wrong with you caring deeply about the freedoms and the liberties that men and women laid their life down to give you. I recognize that. There's nothing wrong with you praying for men and women in places like Cuba today that are working hard to bring independence and freedom to their country and pray for the believers and the preachers and the missionaries and the evangelists who've been working there for years. This is a good thing. Christians cannot exit the public square. But my first allegiance is not to this nation, it's to a kingdom. And Jeremiah didn't step up at his trial and first defend his rights. He said, can I tell you what my God said to you? Because if you're going to listen, I want to say a word about the Lord before I say a word about myself. And so Jeremiah says, God wants you to turn back to him. And then, to me, he makes the statement of the chapter. Look what the Bible says, beginning in verse 13. Now, therefore, mend your ways and your deeds and obey the voice of the Lord your God. And the Lord will relent of this disaster that he pronounced. He quoted, but watch verse 14. But as for me, now Jeremiah's going to talk about himself. But as for me, behold, I'm in your hands. Do with me as seems good and right to you. Only know for certain, if you put me to death, you will bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city and its inhabitants. For the truth of the Lord sent me to you to speak all these words in your ears. But as for me. Jeremiah said, you, you do what you want to with me. I, I'm not in authority here. You guys have all the titles. I'm just going to tell you what God said. If you were to translate, but as for me, it might translate this way in my vocabulary. Cancel me if you want to. I'll trust my God and his word more than the cultural shifts of a broken world. Cancel me if you want to. I will not move off my God or his word. I don't need you to be happy with my beliefs. I have no desire to be your enemy. But if you disregard me because I am being honest and faithful to my God, 
I know when I die, I'm going to stand before him. I don't know where you'll be. You heard about that old country boy one time that was scared to death of flying. And so he got on the airplane and he held his Bible. And he sat down by some sophisticated person who had talked themselves out of the existence of God. And he said, uh, son, what are you doing? He said, I'm scared to death of flying, so I'm holding my Bible. He said, you really believe that Bible? He said, I believe every word of it. I even believe the maps. <laughs> I believe every word of it. He said, he said, how in the world do you think stories in that Bible are true? He said, because God said they're true. He said, you mean to tell me that, that you believe in, in your Bible there? that a man like Jonah lived in the belly of a fish for three days. I said, yeah, I, I believe that. He said, well, what are you, how are you going to know that's going to be true? He said, well, when I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah about him. He said, well, how do you know Jonah will be there? He said, well, if he's not, you can ask I believe it. With all my heart, I believe it. And so, I'm not offended. Don't be on edge. Don't let this world worry you. Don't think that we have to be sucked into conversations of people who are broken and hurting. I know the king. His word is true. And I love the fact that when Jeremiah got a chance to defend his life, he just denied it. They said, you can do with me what you want. I am going to honor the Lord. I thought about old Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When the king said, you must bow down, what'd they say? They said, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. <laughs> in other words, Nebuchadnezzar, you, you don't inform our spirituality. If this be so, our God, whom serves, able to deliver us from the burning fire furnace. In other words, you can throw us in, and he can deliver us. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But then watch. But if not, even if he does, if we burn up today, we'll be with him tonight. If not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Stop worrying about defending and deny yourself and trust the Lord. Last lesson. Last lesson. Being accused is different than being alone. I can promise you that if you're serious about following the Lord, you will find yourselves in situations like Jeremiah. Maybe not with the historical significance of Jeremiah. I hope and pray none of you ever have your life threatened for taking a stand for the gospel. I promise you, you're going to have your business threatened. I promise you, you'll have your beliefs threatened. I promise you, you'll have your comfort threatened. It's coming. But I hope and pray you never have your life threatened. But I can promise you that when you're in those situations, one of the enemy of staying encouraged is Satan's tactic to isolate you, to make you feel alone. Can you imagine how alone Jeremiah must have felt? We know in previous chapters he was told, don't go to funerals anymore, don't go to weddings anymore, stop going through the normal day-to-day -day actions, stand up and shout from the rooftop that these people have lulled themselves to sleep with a system of normalcy that does not honor the Lord. And so Jeremiah was called to make some pretty significant social stands. But he's a man, he's a human. Of course he felt isolated. And right here, he's standing there saying, you may very well kill me. Now, I don't think you should. And if you do, you'll have innocent blood on your hands. But you can do what you need to do. I'm going to do what God tells me to do. And yet, right at the end of this chapter, as we come to the conclusion, three figures emerge out of nowhere, just blips in the radar that show us that God provides people around us to fight beside us, to stand with us, and that through their presence in our life, we truly are never alone. Look what the Bible says happens beginning in verse 16. Then the officials of the people, the priests, the prophets... This man does not deserve the sentence of death. So some folks said, wait a minute. He doesn't deserve to die. Why? Look what happens. Verse 17. <clears throat> and certain of the elders of the land arose and spoke all of the assembled people saying, Micah of Morsheth prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, 
Thus says the Lord, and they quote Micah 3.12. If you love to take notes, this is the only direct quotation of another Old Testament prophet by name in the Old Testament. Old Testament prophecy is quoted back and forth, but this is a specific quote of a specific guy at a specific time, which proves the validity of God's word because Micah predated Jeremiah 100 years. So 100 years before Jeremiah, Micah had quoted, had preached this, and they had recorded it. It also proves that God's people, the moment God's word was spoken, began to preserve it and collect it and build it. It's why we can say that this word is complete, that it's not fragmented or pulled together hundreds of years after the death of Jesus. No, no, no. It was being put together in the moment. And look what the Bible says. Zion shall be plowed as a field. That's Israel. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins and the mountain of the house of the wooded heat. The mountain of the house of wooded heat. Did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all Judah put him to death? Did he not fear the Lord and entreat the favor of the Lord? And did not the Lord relent of the disaster that it pronounced? But we are about to bring great disaster upon ourselves. They said, hey, a hundred years ago, Micah stood up, preached the same message, but King Hezekiah said, you know what, Micah's right. We need to get back right with the Lord. And when they got back right with the Lord, God relented and Jerusalem was not destroyed. It was preserved for a hundred more years. And so some people were listening to Jeremiah and they were going, hmm, we've heard this before. This is not some oddball out of left field. This is a message that has been repeated to generations before us. And then a story of another prophet comes up. His name is Uriah. Look at verse 20. There was another man who prophesied in the name of the Lord to Uriah, the son of Shema from kirith Jerem. He prophesied against the city and against the lands and the words like those of Jeremiah. And when King Jehoiakim, now King Jehoiakim is the current king, When he heard, he didn't act like Hezekiah. He sent and had him killed. Look what the Bible says. And when King Jehoiakim with all his warriors and all the officials heard his words, the king sought to put him to death. Uriah heard of it, and he was afraid and fled to Egypt. Then King Jehoiakim sent to Egypt certain men, Elnathan, the son of Akbar, and others with him. And they took Uriah from Egypt and brought him to the king, Jehoiakim, who struck him down with a sword and dumped his body into the burial place of the common people. So one man gave his life doing the same thing that Jeremiah. You know, this is the only reference to Uriah in the Old Testament. There are other Uriahs, but not this one. This is just unnamed prophet who was saying the same thing at the same time to the same people from the same God, and he lost his life. And then the chapter ends with something very interesting. Verse 24, But the hand of Hiakim, the son of Shaphan, was with Jeremiah so that he was not given over to the people to be put to death. So God used certain elders. He used one man who was willing to die, and he used an official who was willing to defend Jeremiah to preserve his life. And you know what? None of those people are ever mentioned again in the Bible. None of them. You know what Jesus said needs to happen when you get put on trial for your faith? You know what he says in the Scriptures about when you're brought before trial and you're asking what should I say? He said, blessed are you when others revile you, persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And by the time we get to the end of the first century, you know what the writer of Hebrews says about Jesus? Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, witnesses like Uriah, witnesses like Ahiakim, witnesses like those elders who were listening to what Jeremiah said. Let us also lay aside every weight of sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Why? Looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith. Now watch this and see if you don't see a beautiful burden who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You know why you keep going in a culture that wants to cancel you? You know why you stand for the Lord on a job site when the men around you don't? You know why you're honest when it costs you something? You know why you raise your children differently even though there's so much pressure from their peers to dress, to speak, or to act a certain way? Do you know why you exclude certain types of songs and movies and shows from your life? 
Do you know why you click off those images, guys, quickly that come up and tempt us to lust? Do you know why you work hard even when your marriage is difficult to plow through and to grind and to honor the Lord? You know why you say no to things so that you can honor the Lord with your tithe, you can give to support ministry, you can help those that are less in need? Do you know why you keep on keeping on? Because your Savior did. Who for the joy set before him, the joy wasn't the cross. He endured the cross for the reward on the other side. When I think about you, and I think about me, and I think about Jeremiah, and I think about Ahiakim, and I think about Uriah, and I think about those certain elders, I think about the cloud of witnesses that one day will step into a celestial city called a new Jerusalem. And on that day, every burden we were called to bear will be beautiful. It's a beautiful thing to bear a burden for the one who bore so much for us. I want to end today's sermon in an interesting and encouraging way. For those of you that are watching online, due to the nature of what I'm about to do, I have to cut the live feed. We're going to pray over some very special young women who are headed to the mission field. But because of the place they're going and because of the people they're going to engage, We have to protect their security. And therefore, if you've been touched by today's sermon, if you want to speak with a pastor, you can contact us. We're one click away. We would love to follow up with you. God bless you and thank you for those of you who are online who worship with us today.